The Aral Sea lies in a depression in Central Asia, east of the Caspian Sea. Known technically as a landlocked saltwater lake, it was once the fourth largest inland body of water in the world. In the 1950s, the Aral Sea's water resources were largely untouched. Two rivers replenished the sea. Sturgeon and other fish supported a modest fishing industry, and boats served the sea's many islands. The region was governed by the Soviet Union, which, after World War II, took on major water projects with the goal of boosting economic output. Land around the sea was converted from pasture to cotton fields. Farming and other industries drew considerable amounts of water from the rivers that replenished the sea. By the 1980s, water feeding into the Aral Sea had become so scarce that the sea was evaporating away. The sea's water level dropped more than 50 feet by 1989. After the breakup of the Soviet Union, regional governments tried to conserve water and forestall the demise of the sea. But their efforts were poorly coordinated, and so by 2000, the sea level declined by a total of 125 feet. The shoreline narrowed considerably, as seen in this satellite imagery. The sea divided first into smaller pools, then narrow lakes, the Northern Aral Sea and the Southern Aral Sea. They were over three times as salty as the original water. Fish and other life died off. Salt and industrial chemicals once dissolved in the water were carried as dust to the land, causing disease. Isolated islands in the sea that were once secure sites for Soviet germ warfare tests became vulnerable to land access as water evaporated away. Since 2005, water projects have been successful in keeping the northern Aral Sea filled. The southern Aral Sea, however, has been largely abandoned due to desiccation. The mountain ranges of the Tian Shan and the Pamir are the sources of Central Asia's two big rivers, the Amu Darya and the Su Darya. Enormous glaciers flow slowly through the high valleys. It is from these high mountains that the Aral Sea Basin receives much of its water. Central Asia depends on water from two river basins that extend from the glaciers of the Tian Shan and Pamir to the Aral Sea. One is the Surudarya. It is 3,000 kilometers in length and has a catchment area of almost 300,000 kilometers squared. The other is the Amu Darya. It is 2,700 kilometers long and has a catchment area of more than 300,000 kilometers squared. Together, they form the Aral Sea Basin. The Aral Sea Basin grew considerably after the huge expansion of irrigated areas along the two rivers and the construction of the Karakum Canal in Turkmenistan's desert. This resulted in flow reduction of Amu Darya and Sur Darya, and most obvious is the shrinking and drying up of the Aral Sea. The Aral Sea, once one of the largest lakes in the world, has shrunk to 10% of its original size. The water of the two big rivers, Surudarya and Amudarya, is intensely used. Leaving the high valleys of the Tian Shan, the water of Surudarya's main tributary, the Narin River, feeds the Toktagul Dam and Reservoir in Kyrgyzstan. For Kyrgyzstan, energy generation through hydropower plants is of great importance. So the water of Narin guarantees Kyrgyzstan's supply of energy. In its middle reaches, the Surudarya is dammed by the Kairakum Reservoir in the Fergana Valley. From here, pump stations take millions of litres of water to bring them to the fruitful fields of the valley. For centuries, the wide valley has been used for agriculture. Thanks to its extensive irrigation system, the Fergana Valley plays a crucial role in crop production in Central Asia. The valley is the region's breadbasket. Water is unevenly distributed throughout Central Asia. Mountainous countries with glaciers have enormous flows and reserves of water. 
In desert and steppe countries, hardly any water is available. The intensity of water use varies. Mountainous countries with few agricultural areas need less water. However, desert and steppe countries with large irrigated areas need a lot of water to grow their crops. So the agriculture of the downstream countries depends on the water of the upstream countries. Their cooperation is essential to development. Also, the water of Amu Darya is used for energy generation and agriculture. In Tajikistan, the Vaksh River, an important tributary of Amu Darya, is dammed by the Nurek Dam. With a height of 300 metres, it is the tallest dam in the world. Like Kyrgyzstan, for the mountainous Tajikistan, using water for electricity generation is also crucial. Nurek is only one component of a large national power plant grid. Another tributary of the Amu Darya, the Pyanch River, forms a natural border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan. Afghanistan will play an increasingly important role for future water management plans as part of Amu Darya's water originates there. In the north and northeast of Afghanistan, the Kunduz, the Murgab and the Tejen rivers flow into the Amu and eventually into the Karakum Canal. The Pyanch, in particular, contributes huge amounts of water to Central Asia's Great River. Arriving in the plain lands, the Amu Darya is now like a narrow strip of life across the vast desert that spreads for hundreds of kilometres. The Karakum Canal, branching off from the middle reaches of Amu Darya, runs 1,400 kilometres long across the Karakum Desert. It is one of the longest canals in the world. It opened up new tracts of land for agriculture and made possible for cities like Turkmenistan's capital Ashgabat to grow. But the Karakum Canal derives a huge amount of water from the Amu Darya. The river loses up to 50% of its water to the canal. Its construction began in 1954. This lifeline through the desert was a part of man's conquest of nature as proclaimed by Stalin in the Soviet Union. Along the canal, in this once lifeless area, agriculture was now possible. Mass production of cotton was promoted. Still today, it is hard work, but the excellent quality of the cotton makes it a highly profitable and much demanded product. The white gold of Central Asia is traded on markets around the world. Recently, the agricultural structure is being changed towards greater diversification. Dependency on cotton needs to be reduced. The water of Amu Darya and Sir Darya, distributed to the fields by thousands of kilometres of irrigation channels, are now also used for growing rice, maize and other produce. Intensive agricultural use of water in the Aral Sea Basin has consequences. Near the former Aral Sea, the trail of the once powerful Amu Darya gets lost in its vast deltas. Here, hardly any water is reaching the Aral Sea anymore. Nowadays, big parts of the Aral Sea are dead land, desert and steppe. Plants and animals have disappeared. The livelihood for the people living around the Aral Sea is at stake. The wrong use of water in the Aral Sea Basin has led to one of the greatest man-made environmental disasters. It is a big challenge for national and international partners to implement actions which guarantee a more effective and efficient use of water in the Aral Sea Basin. Brothers Talit and Ahmad Ahmad have never seen the sea here. To look at it, you'd think boys like this have been grazing their goats for thousands of years in this harsh desert landscape. But you'd be wrong. 
30 years ago, this desert didn't exist. This was the Aral Sea. At school, our teachers told us what the Oral was like before. They showed us pictures and maps. This is the dried up seabed of the Aral Sea, once the fourth largest freshwater lake in the world. It used to be the size of Ireland. It supported thousands of fishermen who sailed between over 1,100 islands separated by lagoons and narrow straits. There were a lot of fish. My father was a fisherman. When he and my uncles got out of the army in 1948, they'd leave in the morning in two boats. They'd net 200 metric tons of fish by evening. 75-year-old Pyotr Ivanovich Bochkov was the chief engineer of the canning works here in Moynak. When the sea used to reach this town, it provided work and living for some 30,000 people. When the sea was here, the west wind would blow. The shoreline was nearby. It was fresh and clean, like a resort. Now, that sea is 250 kilometers away. The canning factory is an abandoned ruin. And most of the people are gone. The Aral Sea was a vast oasis in the desert on the Silk Road the trading route that linked China to Europe. From space, it's easy to see that the Aral is the most important reserve of water in this vast Central Asian desert. And it's vanishing. This photo was taken in 1973, this one in 1987, and this one in 2000. 80% of the Aral Sea has dried up. It's split in half. This catastrophe is the result of arrogant human engineering. The major rivers that fed the Aral were diverted into leaky irrigation canals to serve thirsty cotton farms. The Aral slid into a disastrous spiral of decline. The dried seabed is now called the Aralkum Desert. It's about 45,000 square kilometers, bigger than the Great Salt Desert in Utah, bigger than Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands combined. As the sea dries, decades of agricultural and industrial pollution are left behind. Now, when the wind blows, deadly dust storms of salt, sand, and chemical pesticides destroy plant, animal, and human lives. All the fruit trees are dead, and they're never coming back. Grass used to grow here. It's all gone. There are likely to be heavy metals and DDT in this cloud. Dust from the Aral blows high into the atmosphere, contributing to climate change. And it travels far. Pesticides from the Aral have been found as far away as the South Pole, in the blood of penguins. And here in nearby Moynak, the former fishing port, 
The catastrophe has brought an epidemic of tuberculosis and other illnesses. Everybody here is ill. The children all have anemia. We don't have proper food, there's no money, and we don't get any aid. Everybody here is suffering from anemia, us too. But never mind, we're still alive. In some places, infant mortality rates have doubled. Acute respiratory diseases account for almost one half of all child deaths. Liver and kidney diseases are becoming more common, as are some types of cancer. Experts think the southern half of the Aral Sea will be completely evaporated within 20 years. Which is why efforts are now focused on trying to lessen the worst effects of the catastrophe. One weapon is a desert-loving local tree called the Saksaul. How do we plant the Saksaul? If you just plant the Saksaul, it won't grow. Why? Take a look. The soil here is full of salt. You need to break up this salty crust. Here we dug a trench last autumn, and we filled it with clean sand. The Saksaul will grow nicely here. See the difference? It's all salty here. And here it's nice and clean. These saplings will grow fast and spread. In just four years, the roots of each tree will hold down several tons of sand. The idea isn't to forest the entire desert, but to protect the most threatened populations. Behind me you can see where a natural wood is growing between the rows we planted. You can hear birdsong here. In the north there's not even a living plant, never mind birds or other animals. That shows what human hands can do. Projects like this are a small way to lessen the impact of the Aral crisis on local people and the rest of the world. This is regional climate change. The waters of the Aral used to warm icy winds from Siberia and reduce the summer heat. Now, summers are hotter, drier and shorter. Winters are longer and colder. While the world worries, rightly, about what melting polar caps will bring to our populated coastlines, people here are dying for lack of water. <laughs> 